evening. Welcome to the San Mateo County Library's Virtual Book Fest. I'm Eileen Gassinetto, Poet Laureate of San Mateo County in California. It's an honor to have with us three award-winning authors in the short story genre. Irano Senekoje, London-based author and winner of the 2020 AKO Kane Prize for African Writing. Merce Ben Shroff, Mumbai-based author and winner of the John Gilgan Fiction Award. And Rico Shesoko, San Francisco-based author and National Endowment for the Humanities Fellow. As Rico said earlier, this is a wonderful way to foster intercultural dialogue. Moving forward with our program, please allow me to introduce our first reader, Rico Shisako, a writer, educator, and activist. Rico received his MFA from the Bennington Writing Seminars and has taught at Boston College, Columbia University, and the Massachusetts College of Art. He has received fellowships from the Center for Fiction, Lambda Literary, and the National Endowment for the Humanities. He is a board member of Kundiman, a national literary organization dedicated to Asian American literature. He lives in San Francisco. Rico will be reading from his book, The Foley Artist, published by Gaudi Boy in Singapore in 2019. Welcome Rico Shisoko. Um, I'm super pleased to be here, not only because uh, it's an amazing international collaboration, I'm so happy to be here with Irinison and Mirza. Um, and also, I wanted to thank the San Mateo Public Libraries, which is my new home. I just moved here about four months ago, so I, I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I'm going to read from uh, my collection, Foley Artist. And this is a short story that's kind of a weird story. I was um, getting to know the work of Arunasin and Mersban, and I was thinking, this is a weird sort of surrealist story. And I just wanted to share it because it, it goes along with, with some of the themes of our, our three works. Um, and it's called Babies. More incredible things had happened, Hugo thought, than a man giving birth. Frogs were born with six limbs. Praying mantises laid eggs in gummy lines, backtracked, and then ate them like licorice. It was the last late evening of summer, and Hugo propped his pillow up in bed, copy editing a piece about the equinox. I want to get pregnant, Hugo said, placing his hand idly on Mitchell's head. Earlier that day, in the crowded newsroom, a freckled intern had seen a pushpin photo of him and Mitchell and remarked that they would have the most beautiful children. Mitch pushed Hugo's hand away. You're kidding, right? He placed his thin spectacles on a stack of milk crates, Hugo's idea of a night table. Reality to planet Hugo, we can barely pay our mortgage and now you want a child? Did the serious ever laugh? Mitch slid off the bed and removed his sweatpants. His, his boyfriend liked to worry about the quotidian things in life, repointing the bricks of their crumbling brownstone or toning his svelte 34 year old body. In the world of respectable people, Mitch was a freelance nutritionist. Health, he liked to repeat to Hugo, is more noble than science. Your body is a temple. Hugo outwardly agreed, keeping to himself the knowledge that biology was fundamental to Mitch's vain world of nutrition. Science, on the other hand, was Hugo's hummus and pita bread. He lay against their headboard and smoothed the velvety nap of the blanket. It wasn't child rearing or adoption Hugo craved. He hadn't thought that far ahead, but the actual creation of human life. His and Mitch's baby. He laughed, lifting his papers and imagining a baby with Mitch's pepper gray hair and his own straw colored skin. Mitch locked in his plastic mouth guard and closed his eyes. In a minute, he was snoring. Hugo set his papers aside and watched his boyfriend sleep and then turned off his lamp. He lay motionless on his back, feeling the leafy shadows from outside shimmer on the painted walls. The room was like a giant aquarium. Slowly, the blanket floated off him, billowing in the room of blue-black water. He too floated up from the bed, reaching his hands to his neck and touching the flaky gills beneath his chin. Light waves splashed the stucco ceiling. And a few fathoms below, Hugo could see the black silt collecting on his computer monitor and along the crevices of the wide hardwood planks. Hugo spread out his arms and kicked lightly, looking down at Mitchell in their neat bed. He exhaled an upward arching stream of bubbles. If male insects could make babies, he wondered, why couldn't he? Thanks. Thank you so much, Rico. Our next reader is Morspin F. Schroff, a Mumbai-based writer whose work has appeared in over 65 literary journals in the US and UK. 
He is the winner of the John Gilgan Fiction Award and has received six Pushcart Prize nominations. His short story collection, Breathless in Bombay, was shortlisted for the Commonwealth Writers' Prize in the Best Debut category from Europe and South Asia and rated by The Guardian as among the 10 best Mumbai books. His novel, Waiting for Jonathan Koshi, was a finalist for the Horatio Nelson Fiction Prize in New York and has been published in India and China. His collection of di digital shorts, Fast Track Fiction, serves up a mix of literary nuggets for the digital reader. Welcome, Merce Benchra. And uh, very excited about sharing my work with my co-panelists and our readers. My sincere thanks to the San Metro Library. I haven't had the opportunity to be there, but I'm hoping to uh, rectify that soon. Um, okay, I think, so I'm going to be reading from uh, my third book, uh, which is Fast Track Fiction. The reason I created this was, uh, there's an interesting story as to how I came to write Fast Track Fiction. Uh, you see, every evening around twilight, I take my walks along this promenade in Bombay, which is this lovely sea facing kind of walk, you know. And one day as I was walking there, I saw this, this crowd, this small crowd of locals kind of huddled and nudging each other. And I looked to see what was amusing them. And I saw that they were looking at this couple, this middle-aged couple who were on their cell phones. And the wife was kind of, had keeled over and she was so engrossed in her cell phone and she happened to be very, very well endowed. And these guys were kind of chuckling because, you know, neither the husband nor the wife realized that, you know, that the woman had the men's attention. So when I saw this, Couple, I said, hey, you know, I don't know what they're looking at in their cell phones, but I want these guys as my readers, you know, and therefore I created a book specifically for the cell phone, uh, you know, e-shorts, what I call them, and they're not, it's not really flash, flash fiction, it's a hybrid model between fiction and non-fiction, you know, the kind of stories you tell at a party as a raconteur or the kind of stories you tell to kind of uh, make a point, so it's a kind of interesting model which, which is of the realism of non-fiction, and it's got the narrative pace of fiction. So uh, I'm going to read you a couple of pieces from Fast Track Fiction. Before I get there, I just want to share that uh, I use a short story format uh, slightly differently. I use it to highlight not just character-driven fiction, but also, also issue-based fiction. Being in a country like India, there are a lot of issues one needs to tackle all the time. You know, civic apathy, encroachment, uh, usurpation of uh, public spaces, usurpation of green zones. So there are a lot of issues which grab your attention and which you can address through a short story format, you know. So I'm going to read, uh, basically I'm going to read two or three pieces. The first one I'm going to read is, is on, uh, it's so, you know, among the banes of India, what is one, which is, is, is is this, this is bogus spirituality, you know, which we are drawn to. So there is this whole uh, accent on, you know, fake uh, fraud gurus and God men who come and people are very superstitious. And as I said in, in one of my pieces, you know, here you have where the religious are corrupt and even the corrupt are religious. You know, so I thought I'd address this whole issue of bogus spirituality. With that, I'm going to read my piece. It's called Baban Swami's Wisdom. Baban Swami's Wisdom. In which Meenal Bakshi, beset with marital problems, her husband, her husband has started picking on her and the kids ever since his event management company had hit a slump, decided to consult a spiritual guru, Baban Swami, on the advice of her dear friend, Yogini Mishra. This was after she had consulted a marriage counselor who asked that Meenal bring her husband with her. Her husband had raved and ranted the moment she had suggested it. He was furious that she had taken their personal problems out of the family and said that maybe she was the reason for his failure. She was the jinx in his life. He had wept. She had wept during this and poured her heart out to Yogini, a friend from college, who had promptly arranged a meeting with Baban Swami. And the, guru had been, and the guru had been most attentive. He heard her out patiently, even allowed her to cry a little, then said, your troubles have nothing to do with his business or your relationship. You are meant to be together. If you weren't, you wouldn't have produced such lovely children. You do love your children, don't you? And Meenal had nodded and said, he used to be such a loving father. 
I don't know what's come over him. Now all he does is shout and scream at us. The slightest thing sets him off. I know he's going through a bad time, but why take it out on us? The guru stroked his beard pensively. Meenal could tell he was thinking hard on her behalf. Eventually, he said, from what I see, it's the energy in your house. It's all wrong. It's disruptive. It's what's creating this problem. I don't know how it has entered and taken root, but I do know that you need to clean it and you need to do it fast before it multiplies. Can it do that, she asked. Of course, that's how it works. It feeds on misery. And that's why we need to act promptly. Tell me how, she said. I can't deal with this negativity anymore. If it weren't for the, if it weren't for the children, I would have filed for a divorce. That won't be necessary, said Babban Swami. I would, I would advise you to install in your house a deity that has been consecrated by me. This deity will diffuse the negative energy and clean your house of any bad vibrations. Within a few weeks, you will see a change. You will find the atmosphere transformed. He smiled at Meenal and a flame of hope sprang in her heart. The guru had a kindly face. There was something very comforting and soothing about him. She felt a surge of gratitude for yogini. Only, said the guru, it will be expensive. And with your husband's business in trouble, I don't know how you will afford it. How expensive, she asked softly. Around three lakh rupees. You see, for it to work, there has to be a certain percentage of silver in it. And then there is the cost for the pujas. We have to do one morning, evening, one morning, afternoon and evening for two weeks so that it stores all that energy. I can reduce cost somewhere, but in your case, I don't want to compromise because it must solve both your marriage troubles and the business problem. Yes, she said, that's what I want too. But please don't worry about the money. I can ask my father for it. He will never say no to me. She smiled at him warmly and he smiled back. His eyes seemed to be glowing. They were the eyes of an enlightened person, alert, reassuring, full of promise. Two weeks from then, the deity arrived. It was three feet tall and had a circular base. It dazzled with a silver sheen and its right hand was raised in blessing. Six young women in white saris came and prayed and chanted before it for two hours. They taught Meenal how to do the puja. She would have to do it twice daily in order to recharge its energy. Before leaving, they handed her a bill for 24,000 rupees. This came as a shock because Guruji had said nothing about this. Now Meenal did not want to show herself as petty, so she asked her husband for the money. He exploded. This was the last thing they needed, he said. Some mumbo jumbo spirituality. She pleaded and said she would pay him back, but he refused. She began to cry. And this stuck something in him. He went and got his checkbook and wrote out a check to the Baban Swami Foundation. The ladies blessed them and left. Thereafter, Meena started taking care of the deity. Baban Swami had prescribed two pujas daily and given her some mantras which she'd have to chant regularly. In the bargain, some housework got neglected and the food that came to the table was bland and lacking in taste. The more time Meena spent with the deity, the more she was convinced that it was a living, breathing presence which guided and protected her. There was something very special about it, she felt, and soon she grew indifferent to all other matters of the house. This enraged her husband. His fits of anger worsened. He mocked and abused her, smashed things around the house. In the course of one of his fights, he went to strike the deity, but Meenal sprang at him, eyes blazing, and said, Strike me if you must, but don't you dare touch my goddess. Come near her and I will kill you. The same week, she took an appointment with Baban Swami. This time, she was accompanied by Yogini. Nothing has changed, she said to the Guru sadly. It's become worse, in fact, his behavior. And now it's directed at the deity too. I don't know what to do. I feel so helpless. To her surprise, Bhappan Swami started laughing. He threw back his head and laughed heartily. It's all good, he said, his eyes twinkling. You don't need to do a thing. The deity is doing it all for you. Don't you see her plan? Don't you see her intention? She's getting all his anger out, all his poison. And at the same time, she's eradicating whatever karma he has with you. All that bad karma he, you might have built up in some past life. 
Now, surely you don't want to carry this karma into another life, do you? You want to finish it here and now. So just stay calm and let the deity do her work. She needs to see you have faith in her. And Yogini nodded, looked at Meenal and nodded. And Meenal nodded back. It made sense what Guruji was saying. Ending her karma with her husband was indeed an inviting prospect. And if the deity was working on that, who was she to complain? It was a very different Meenal who went home that day. Now when her husband would make some demand, she would rise to meet it willingly. And when he would scream and shout at her, she would smile and hum away. And when she would sit in puja, she would whisper to the deity in a soft confiding voice, as though they shared some deep and ancient secret. So that's uh, Baban Swami's wisdom. So, you know, this was something I felt I had to tackle this whole aspect of bogus spirituality because um, this is something which is worrying us now. And we, we even have a uh, we even have a leader who thinks he's a wannabe, a closet kind of guru. He comes and instead of telling us about our political progress, he's always telling us how to be good human beings, what to do, and you know, uh, you know, prescribing recipes for our soul. So you know this and this whole accent on on bogus spirituality, I think, is one of the things which is holding back our personal progress. Uh, in fact, uh, just a few months ago, a few uh, a year or so ago, we had this uh, fraud uh, godman who had 14 estates to his name, hundreds of cars and you know, Rolls Royces. And he had convinced 400 of his male disciples to castrate themselves, seeing, the, seeing that they will attain Nirvana if they do that. You know? So I thought this was an important aspect I needed to address in my book. I mean, how we uh, place the time, I would like to read one more short piece, if that's okay with you guys. Or do you want to get into a discussion? I, I mean, I know Sen still has to read. Um, so, could um, I, sorry? Yes, yes, sure. Right. Could I possibly read one more piece? Yes. So this is uh, this is one on, on the education sector in uh, India. So sometime back, so I like to research certain sectors and see what's going on there. And education is something which is definitely lacking in our country. In fact, we just had the new education policy announced. And what is a real shame is that while they, they have these grandiose plans, no one is talking about how to bring back people who are dropping out back into education. And on one of my forays, I, I visited a tribal school, which I discovered was right next to the highway. So it was very risky for the children. And it was a residential school for tribal children. And the kids stayed overnight in a room. And in that same room, there were, there were about 60 of them staying in this large room. And in the same room in the morning would convert into a classroom. You know? So when I saw this, I said, let me go and now understand what's happening in the public education sector. So this is a story which came out of my research in, in public education, in schools and public education. Uh, I'm going to read it out. It's called a real education because it was a real education for me. A real education. In which Raj Avasti, a young man of 26, in which Raj Avasti, a young man of 26, employed as a school inspector in the education department, is asked to find out why four out of 10 children in Mumbai's public schools drop out before reaching the eighth grade. What was baffling to the department was that the kids fared exceedingly well in their test till the second, seventh grade, after which they drop out. Now Raj, possessing an imaginative mind, decides to pose as a structural engineer so that he might loiter in the school prem premises and gather information which he might not be privy to otherwise. Armed with a letter from his department, introducing him as a structural engineer appointed to survey schools, Raj decides to visit schools in low-income neighborhoods and slums. The first school he finds is located at the end of a sewer on top of a public toilet. The second school has some repair work going on because of which the students are made to sit in long dark corridors without windows. Here, someone has ingeniously painted the corridor walls black so that, that they, might be, they might be used as blackboards. Walking around with a measuring tape in his hand, Raj notices in some schools, the toilets are washed once a week and the girls' toilets have no doors. Soon the teachers got used to seeing Raj. They referred to him as that handsome young engineer with a kind face. The teachers invited him to join them for lunch, which he accepted. 
over sabudana khichdi aloo bhaji and dal they grilled him about his education where had he lived had he saved enough was he looking for a nice girl from a nice family and they giggled when he blushed after a week or two they started opening up to him they told him about some difficulties they faced many of these kids came from poor illiterate families they did not speak english at home hence they could not take to english easily so although the syllabus was in english they had to continue teaching in the local language which was hindi or marathi that way the children were comfortable they did not have to struggle with an unfamiliar language of course the kids would have to show their appreciation they would have to run errands for the teachers get them tea or snacks buy their vegetables get their footwear repaired when it tore in the crowded trains they would also have to wash their teachers plates and lunch boxes after lunch which was no big deal because he skipped lived at home anyway on the third week the teachers whispered to raj that they even helped the kids score high marks in their test how asked raj why died by writing out the answers ourselves with our left hand said one of the teachers proudly Why left hand? Asked Raj, puzzled. The teachers laughed and exchanged cool glances. Then, lowering a voice, one of them said, "So that that stupid school inspector wouldn't guess that we are behind it. It would resemble a child's handwriting, rough and shaky." Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So this, this this actually came out in my research that uh, when teachers were interviewed for the job, they were asked that, "Can you write in your left hand?" so they would ask why they said because you will have to simulate these uh, kids and writing you will actually have to have to submit papers which are which seem to be a written in a child's crawl so i thought this just uh, called for a bit of an exposure so thank you so much mersben now please welcome irenosen okoje irenosen was born in nigeria and moved to england aged 8 her debut novel butterfly fish published by jack randa books won a Betty Trask award and was shortlisted for the Edinburgh First Book Award. Irene Ozen has been a judge for the Society of Authors, the London Short Story Prize, the Royal Society of Literature, the Berlin Writing Prize, Henley Literary Festival and Miss Lexia Short Story Competition. She is currently a judge for the BBC National Short Story Award. She was the first writer in residence for Words of Color. Curatorial projects include Black Joy for the BBC, Maverick Women and the Moon featuring Margaret Atwood among others. She is a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature. Her next two books, Nudi Branch and Kurandera, have been signed by Little Brown's Dialogue Books. Nudi Branch was recently featured in Vanity Fair magazine. It was championed by Margaret Atwood as a wild recommended read and selected as one of the best books of the year in the Guardian and Observer Review by Bernardine Evaristo and Diana Evans. It was long listed for the Jalak Prize. Irene Ozen is the winner of the 2020 AKO Kane Prize for Fiction for her story Grace Jones. She lives in East London. Welcome Irene Ozen Okoje. me Eileen I'm really pleased to be here um with Mersvan and Rico and yourself um and being part of this um, this wonderful festival uh, so I'm going to read from um, my latest collection which is Nudi Brank um and it's a collection of modern day fables sort of weird fantastical stories about characters on the fringes kind of coming to terms with some sort of change in their life uh, and you know how they sort of move forward and navigate with that but couch within these sort of dark um fantastic and weird weird um little portholes uh this particular story that i'm going to read from mangata is about an albino man who returns back to his home country of mozambique after his mother dies to sort of build water fountains in the town but it's a very precarious journey um for him because um albinos are very much persecuted in africa and i really wanted to explore the experience of being an other within an other and what that's like um that sort of complication of straddling um you know um this sort of two identities so yeah i'm going to read from mangata The man who brought a miracle to the small town in northern Mozambique was both remarkable and ordinary. As an albino, he wasn't an unfamiliar sight 
although other things indicated he was different. He walked with a certain comfort in his skin that wasn't of the surroundings, assured, confident. He had a birthmark on his neck, which looked like a stem growing from his movements. His nails were painted black, his hands elegant, the fingers long, tapered. His tongue sported a silver ring at the tip, a pink pierced entity darting out readily to abandon his mouth. On the afternoon that Terry Midas arrived, it was scorching. He stood at waiting at the pickup point near the market, a black god painted alabaster holding his light travel bag. His batik shirt had sweat patches, tan trousers stuck to his clammy thighs uncomfortably. The dust covered leather sandals he wore felt heavy. He having walked a few miles in the bush to get to this point. He'd done so with trepidation, fear scattering wildfire into his veins as it spread through his limbs. He knew the stories of albinos being persecuted, hunted for the value of their body parts, kidnapped, killed and sold. During the walk in his mind's eye, he'd seen flashes of cutlasses raised up, bones on the necks of men whispering in the voices of ancestors, the cries of medicine men splintered in his ears. He'd seen blood in the sky and the trees shedding pale skin. He'd arrived at the market gratefully, spat from the torturous bush out of breath. Ten years away and nothing had prepared him for the intensity of being back. The heat, the dusty roads, the shanty houses made quaint by the distance of separation. The slick black bodies rhapsodic in their freedom. He hadn't been primed for the warmth, small bursts of joy, the fear, the feeling of familiarity, the feeling of being foreign, a mouthful of echoes slipping teasingly out of reach. Sweating profusely, he stood, walked to a shaded corner of the shop he decided to wait at, thinking of albinos that had appeared to him through night traffic, hundreds of them, each holding angles of light doubling as rabbit holes. It came to him then, the memory of that night years ago, the thick suffocating heat, sluggish grasshoppers chorusing, mosquitoes hovering around the one stubby shrinking candle in their shack as if drawn to a possible death. Mama Carlos sat snoozing gently by the door to protect him in a ritual that saw her bloodshot eyes close reluctantly, eventually succumbing to the demands of the body, her large bosom rising steadily up and down, the small picture of Christ pinned on the wall above the green mosquito net, which swooped down, tiny winged fireflies with far too much gumption zigzagging above their heads, and Christ's robes singed from the blue candle flame that thought it could fly, bending willfully in the heat, his eyes temporarily blinded by tiny bloodshot figures taking residence there. Terry on the bed, tossing and turning, the sound of water in the empty petrol can on the floor by his pillow of bunched clothes. Then three men kicked down their door. He saw the glint of blades at Mama Carlos's throat, heard rough, urgent orders being issued, Mama Carlos screaming so loudly their response was a backhand slap to her face. Terry shrank back against the wall, powerless, pale and trembling. Necklaces of small bones on the men's necks jangled, their faces partially obscured by handkerchiefs tied over their mouths. The smell of the day swept from their bodies mingled with fear in the room was potent. They dragged him to the rusted white truck outside, dumped him in the back, then piled in laughing, the truck screeching away, exhaust pipe smoke curling around the edges of an abduction. They sped off, the truck eventually wound its way around the bush. It was at this point Terry leaped out, running for his life. He ran so fast blindly, an alabaster boy slipped from the world's pocket into the night's cruel playground. He ignored the scratches of wild plants on his legs, the stinging on his arms. The men had left the truck, whistling crudely, clicking their fingers to catch him again. A path snaked through the bush, appearing from nowhere, glimmering, rising, rushing, similar to the noise made in their petrol can at home. 
He ran along the path. He never remembered how he got all the way back to the village. He cried in relief at the people gathered holding kerosene lamps, babbling at them frantically half out of his mind and skin. And everything being in the wrong place, their shack uprooted from Mama Carlos's injuries, the girl who'd given him a green banana earlier in the day, balancing a basket of bones instead on her head, clicking her fingers, crisis photo tearing through the roots of the truck, his face covered with a soiled handkerchief, Mama Carlos screaming into the petrol can, the candle flame growing into a blue tongued carcass in the bush, and the lines of the night reduced into the shape of a howl beneath tires crunching on stones. I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Ray Nelson. You know, as a poet, I am fascinated with the short story genre because like short story writers, poets are always mapping out the outlines of everyday life. Um, density matters immensely because the space for words in a poem is limited, so you have to choose your words wisely. Every line or verse has to be tightly crafted. So most of the time with a short story, as with poetry, you, you just get a glimpse of how a character thinks or behaves outside linear thought processes. And towards the end, oftentimes you come away with more questions. With um, these parameters, uh, and based on the stories you just read, how, how does or how can a short story be reflective of a socio-political situation? Irene Nelson first. I don't know if I'm always thinking about how it can be um, specifically reflective, but what I am thinking is how I can reflect that world, um, how I can reflect what the characters characters going through, and you know, being able to do it within um, a really immersive space that the reader can can completely feel connected to. I think that's what um, I try to focus on. So you know, loosely, I will have the idea, and it may be that I'm thinking, well, how what's it like for a woman who struggles with mental health issues, who's just lost her mother and she's kind of coming to terms with that. Um, how do I explore that? How do I reflect her reality um, within the story? So um, some of that is kind of, I guess, based on um, real life experience of the people that I've, I've come across and we all have gone through situations in our lives. So I think that that authentic element, um, you know, you're always looking for the authenticity uh, within the story. So I kind of draw from that. Um, but then also there's the space for imagination. Um, and, you know, I know specifically for me, I, I really care about language. Um, I'm really interested in the spaces between language. So I read a lot of poetry, actually, um, to sort of open up my mind before I start writing, because I found that that practice, um, like you said, you know, you only poets only have a limited amount of space on the page. Um, but, you know, every single word earns its place. Um, and that is really, really like fascinating in terms of what you do with language. So um, I found that really a kind of rigorous training grounds. But interestingly enough, my writing is sort of more dense, but also poetic and also lyrical. So I think there are rhythms of poetry in, in the work, um, you know, as well as sort of marrying the everyday and the surreal. Like what I want to do is reflect like the reality of somebody, but I also want the magic, the magical element of, of like how we move through the world and the things that, you know, the eye don't necessarily visibly pick up, but it's sort of there, you know, we are, connected to our environment and we need to be more connected I think in terms of what we see and you know uh, some of the more fantastical things that we feel but don't necessarily articulate so I'm able to do that on the page and I really I really enjoy like bringing all of those things together um, and like I said often you know I will have the idea but we were talking about characters running away with themselves earlier and that happens a lot with my stories <laughs> where you know you have the idea and you're and you're kind of so like it's such a I don't know about you guys but it's such a feverish process for me like writing the short story like I just I have to get it out because I'm so sorry my hat is coming off in excitement because I'm so like you know I'm so invested as the, as the writer um, I'm so invested in those characters that I just become sort of the vessel to tell the story, um, you know, and then often I'll write it and then I'll go back and read it and say, well, does this, 
is this saying what I really want it to say? Is it, is it being authentic in terms of like that character's experience? Um, you know, so for example, like this guy who's an albino man, I really wanted to reflect that it's dangerous for him to come back to, you know, that country. It's dangerous because the things that you and I take for granted, like, uh, you know, going to the lake to get water or spending time with friends, like they could get kidnapped within that space of time and killed, you know. So while, while it's like lyrical with like hopefully lots of striking imagery, it also captures that sense of fear, like the kind of anxiety that comes with being in that situation, but also the experience of having lost his mother. So I tried to put it all um, in, in, in the story as much as possible. But yeah, I could talk on and on. So I'll let the other guys <laughs> answer the question too. The joy of Zoom where I'm like, oh, I'm on mute. Um, <laughs> I, I love what Arena said is saying and, and we were talking a little bit about that before, um, before the conversation started. And you know, the, the story that I, I read, it's called Babies. And I'm thinking about your question um, Aileen, which is, I'm thinking about socio-political issues, I'm thinking about race and sexuality, and in this story I'm thinking about age and family, but the characters have to take over, you know, it has to live through the characters. So even though they they have these concerns, or, or more, maybe they're more my concerns as a writer, the, the characters are just living their lives. They're not like, I am a Filipino-American gay man, and I have feel this about the world, you know, that's not the way the characters live. So. Um, you, you know, we just let it play out. If the characters are alive, they kind of live the issues through the story and mm -hmm. the narrative. Um, one of the things that I discovered, I was listening to Ernestin, and I, I love that, that, that our characters take over, you know? And what's really happening in this story, it's this really weird, surreal story where the, the guy actually does get pregnant. And it's <laughs> not, you know, you, you get kind of can get caught up in that, but <laughs> the world they live in is he is pregnant and <laughs> tell the husband and that's that's the thing so it's not questioning that it's more about the disintegration of their relationship it's actually that they're coming apart as a couple so you know for me it's really the interesting questions of of character and, and everyday life that reflects you know the social political issues um, and, and you know I, I love what Irina is saying like I'm a person who who cares about language too and it can kind of get in the way of the of the storytelling for me as as a fiction writer. I admire poets, Aileen. I was like, I don't know how you do it because if I cared about every word like like I do, but I, I have to just get to the end of the draft. So I don't know if that's the way you feel, Mersban. It's it's kind of like the language can get in the way for me as a, as a fiction writer, um, but I still care about it. <laughs> language is uh, sorry, man. So I think language is very key in this whole thing. It's like uh, uh, Flaubert's mother said, you know, that there was there was a time when Flaubert took uh, a week over uh, two pages, and she said, "I could see that the pursuit of the perfect phrase desiccated his heart." You know, so and uh, I think uh, I mean, without wanting to seem immodest, I mean, the fact that uh, I brought in all these Pushcart nominations is because I revisit my work anywhere between uh, 25 to 30 times each, each of my stories. And I go back, it's, it's, it's trying to invest a certain compact uh, elegance into each story. It's also trying to sustain a kind of certain narrative force and pressure which does not let up. Because unlike, unlike a novel which allows for slackness, in a short story you're being watched very minutely and closely. You know, there can be no slipping up in a short story. You have to keep that tempo you have to get into the character's mind right away and make him or her relatable. So I think there is a very different, in, in a certain sense, a short story is a very promiscuous form of writing in the sense like Irina Sen said, you can take it where you want to, the character can run away. At the same time, there's a lot of verbal discipline in what you do because you cannot slip up for a moment, you know? There has to be a certain narrative pressure. And um, the way the process works for me is that I get very fascinated by issues and a character type. So for example, in my, in my first book, which was Breathless in Bombay, where I explored the lives of migrant workers, I, I started asking myself that what were the issues that assail them? Like, let's say they're the washermen, you know? We have the Dobi community, which is uh, this old community who, who wash clothes. And I said, how do they feel? Because for them, the real competitor is a washing machine, you know? Or if they have a, a water cup, they cannot fulfill their obligations. So I was kind of, so there's this hill where, where these washermen wash the clothes and then they, they hang them up to dry. 
and every morning I would turn turn up there and just sit there and say, okay, make me hear some songs, you know, because while while kind of washing the clothes, they would sing the song and they would beat up the clothes and they would say, who the, who the fuck is this guy? Why is he coming here? You know, I mean, kind of thing. And like I you know said, uh, Sen said, I would return to the place eight to ten times just to make sure I was authentic and that the problems I was depicting were not. Particular to a per particular subset of the community, and they were yeah. characteristic of the community as, as a whole. So that is the kind of authenticity one strives for, and I think the reader senses that when you uh, work towards that goal. And also, I find it's interesting to work with a character type and with a certain issue because you may not address politics directly, but what you address is a fallout of bad politics. So, for yeah. example, if there are environmental violations, it's bad politics, or there's a builder politician lobby, it's bad politics. So you address those kind of issues that actually have a sociological impact and a cultural impact rather than uh, direct politics. Thank you so much. Um, so my, this question is somehow related to the first. Um, what is your creative process like? Are there any rituals you would like to share with us? Yeah, I mean, I... So I write very early in the mornings because I just find that that lends itself really well to the sort of writing I do because I'm sort of half asleep still. Um, and that sort of half asleep, half awake state, I find really interesting, like what comes out. Um, so I usually write for maybe three hours um, when I'm working on a project um, very early in the mornings and like for three to four days um, in the week. And then I have the rest of the week off because I like to write in short bursts. I'm not one of these writers that can s spend like seven hours in the day, eight at like just writing like that's, I find that that quite draining. And I like to be excited about the process. I like to come back, like leave things to sort of, you know, marinate and then come back to the page really excited rather than, I don't know, getting a bit stressed out trying to write for six hours. Because I think what happens is you get bored as a writer, well, me personally. And if I get bored, then the reader gets bored and it shows in the work. But if I keep it nice and tight, but incremental, then you still have that kind of excitement while the momentum is building up. So for me, that's how I, that's how I work. So like three to four days and then the rest off, uh, you know, and it's quite nice for me to kind of write in the mornings. I mean, I'm, I'm a freelancer, but before when I, I was like working full time, I, I would write and then go to work because I couldn't come back from work and write because I just, I'd be drained, you know, I just wouldn't have the, the head space for it. So it's like, I'm, I'm really, I don't know about you guys, I'm sure it's the same, but I'm really protective of that writing time and that space <laughs> because so much else is going on um, that can kind of take up that space if you're not careful. Uh, but I, I love that I'm writing when the rest of the world is asleep. There's something really magical about that for me. So um, that's that's how I kind of like to to do it. Yeah. And you hate it when life interferes, right? Sorry? You hate it when life interferes with your writing. Yeah, because then it's yeah. like, well, I, wanna, I want life to happen because that makes me more interesting as a writer. But I don't want it to interfere with the writing. On your time, yes, on your time. No, exactly, your yeah. Because then it's like, oh, this needs to be done. And that, you need to speak to that. But it's just like, oh, God, I don't have the time anymore to focus on this. But if I do it early when everybody, nobody can bother me, <laughs> <laughs> then I at least get the peace. You know, I think it's just that quiet time that, that's like really, um, you. it's almost like a meditative space for me. Like it's, it's, it's really lovely. It's really nice. And I like just going into that um, well, without you, having any sort of disruptions. So, yeah. Oh, I always say writing is like meditation. You know, the deeper you go, the more yeah. pleasure it gives you, you know? So, okay. I'm not a morning person at all, you know? So I, I kind of, <laughs> uh, I, I have the old Bertie Wooster theory, you know, like you spend the early hours in bed. <laughs> get up luckily and uh, but one of the amazing things I discovered recently about a year back is uh, when you talk about nurturing your writing space you know and nurturing your mind because that's so important to get yourself in at this very elevated level where it's just you and your soul and you know you're kind of flowing and I think um, one of the things I discovered recently is I, I spent two hours or three hours 
uh, of my morning reading because that really set me in a good mood, you know, mm. on my on my writing days. And yeah. I spend time with my favorite writers, and you know, it's that that sort of uh, sets the tone for the whole day, actually. And then I kind of get a few nitty gritties out of the way. I mean, some writing has to be done, or you know, some of um, life's more unsavory tasks. Uh, and then I start writing post lunch actually, and I write till around six thirty seven, maybe eight. Then I go for a long pacing walk where I can sort out all my little knots, whatever I need to, you know, look at my various plot options, my storyline options. <laughs> Come back, have dinner, and I start again. Yeah. And since I publish a lot in the U.S., so I, I, I usually end up working on U.S. time. And I'm exactly mm-hmm. the kind of writer Iris uh, does like. I mean, I, I write obsessively. So sometimes it's seven hours, ten hours, fourteen hours. <laughs> <laughs> you know. It's, 14, not, it's not that I don't like it. It's that I'm envious, Smurf fan. Right. I know? can't do it. That's. <laughs> So that, that takes I admire time. that you can do it. I admire, you know, I admire that you can do it. And I think that's the thing. It's like, you have to know yourself as a writer and what works for you. You know yeah. what I mean? Because and we can, short- we could all be trying to do it the way somebody else does it. And it, you know, because of some pre- prescribed ideal of how you're supposed to work. But if that doesn't suit you and it doesn't work for you, then, you know, you have to figure out what does. So, um, like I say that jokingly, but it's because I'm like, wow, these people can really write for eight, like a long time. You know, it's impressive. Okay. So, but yeah. You know, <laughs> you know, like you're saying that, you know, when you kind of get obsessed about a character and he or she runs away with you. So, you know, on the page, yeah. uh, say on, on your sixth or seventh page, when you know you're hitting your stride and the character's totally taken over and you just don't want to mm-hmm. let go. So that's what I do. I yeah. complete the journey with that, you know. Yeah, oh. yeah. Rico was saying that earlier. We were talking about that very point um, about characters taking over. Um, yeah. Well, how is it for you, Rico? Well, I think I'm similar. I write in the mornings. I, I, I like that half dream state a lot. Like I love like not having to get dressed and just having coffee and just being by myself. And I yeah. think as writers and as you know, you both know this. Uh, all three of you know this. We have to take. We have to be a little selfish. And I feel less guilty, the ex-Catholic in me feels less guilty if it's a time when other people are sleeping and the world isn't putting pressure on me. I'm like, this is me time. So um, I love that. I love that sort of selfishness of writing. And also like process wise, I love that you said that, Mers, but I love reading. And, and if I'm not having a good writing day, because personally, I find writing torturous as a writer. I'm just like, I can do an hour. I do my hour every day. And then, you know, hopefully I get to a second hour. But um, it's really hard for me. So I'm like, if I'm going to spend some time reading, that's OK, too. Like, I'll dip into some Toni Morrison. I like, give me some, give me something rich, you know? Give yeah. me some Galway Canal that gets me going. And that, I think, is part of the writing process. I, I talk to my students a lot about being kind to themselves. Be kind yeah. to yourself. And when you're reading, that's part of the writing process. I don't know if you both feel that, but. Yeah. You, I think... you said something about uh, a character taking over. Now, in that context, I must share with you guys that I read this amazing story by Julio Corteza uh, mm-hmm. recently, where there is a main character is reading a novel. And you slowly realize, it, it's just a three-page story. You realize that and it, it's a murder mystery. And you don't know who this uh, character is going for, and you realize that actually the reader is is, is the victim, you know. Oh. And the character comes out of a novel and gets it, and it's a colossal story. You must you must get your and that it's a collection great. called called, called Blow, Up, Blow Up. It's a collection oh, called Blow Up, and the, the, the title story got made into a film, one of the most successful Argentinian films. Here. So, What's the collection called, Mersfan? It's called Blow Up. Blue Arm. Blow Up, Blow Up, that's it. Okay, Blow Up. Okay. Yeah, okay. Nice. Who, who's yeah, your it's very, it reminds me of Calvino, you know, the very meta, you know, have you all read, um, I forgot which one, on a, If on a Winter's Night a Traveler, where mm. suddenly you're reading it and then it stops and you're like, yeah. as a reader, you're like, God damn it, like you can't. <laughs> Thank you for openly sharing your process and your insights with us. Lastly, uh, can you tell us what projects you are working on, if any? Um, how are you making sense of the world right now? <laughs> I'm like, I'm just getting, I'm, di- I'm being distracted by other things rather than the, the novel I'm supposed to be working on, which I'm feeling really guilty about. I was just saying um, this earlier. So I'm trying to work my way back to the novel, but I'm hoping 
like I'm, I've been given a few commissions, like nonfiction stuff and just other things. So, and I'm hoping that, you know, sometimes when you take a side path, that's interesting, you can, it can bring you back to the main thing. So like, I'm just hope because my head is like, I'm just processing everything that we've, we've been through and it's just so much. Um, I managed to write one story um, a couple of months back and I was really pleased about that. But then after that, my brain was just like, oh, I, get, I can't concentrate. I would go to the writing desk and just, you know, like it just wouldn't happen. So rather than like punishing myself, <laughs> I thought, okay, it's fine. Just, just read, do other things, you know, work on an essay. So I'm, I'm, I'm work doing, like I'm doing other things that are distracting me. And then, yeah, hopefully like I'll get back to the novel. Um, like it, it's my second novel and I've forgotten how hard writing a novel is um, just in terms of like momentum. This is why I love writing short stories because I actually think that short stories, certainly in the UK, I, I think in America it's different. Um, they're not valued in the same way um, because people tend to value the novel more. Um, but I think short stories actually can be like harder because you have like less time and you know, you have to create these mini worlds and really make sure people are fully invested in them, you know? So like, I love the practice of short stories and I find that th that gives me confidence, you know, um, because it just, I'm so excited about these worlds that when I go back to something like a novel, which can seem, I don't know, gargantuan sometimes, um, you, like, like very often in the past, I've looked at like the, my first novel, like I looked at the chapters as like interconnected short stories after I'd written my first collection and then went back to do the second draft of the novel because I was like, how am I going to get back to this novel? Like, what am I going to do with it? Oh my God, I'm so stressed out. Um, but then working on the shorts, just it just energized me. And I think that that's what short stories do. Like they just, I find them really invigorating. Um, so I'm hoping to like... <laughs> borrow some of that for this novel that um that I'm I'm working on so yeah one day at a time I guess you know how it is <laughs> so true. Uh, I will say uh, short stories the, the difference between a novel because that's something I also grapple with because I love short stories I think as a genre it's it's very significant and mm. it's tougher than a novel in a sense because it's more obsessive yeah. there's more responsibility but uh, I think uh, a short story a, 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 Cause, definitely calls for more deeper introspection than a novel, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think a short story reader is a different kind of an animal uh, in the sense that uh, they're looking for introspection over entertainment. Whereas with a novel, you've got to resolve things. Yeah, it's a bit pat, if you know what I mean, you know? Whereas with a short story, you can just raise questions and you've done your job, you know? Yeah. yeah. And it's not easy raising questions because you're getting people to introspect, right? So yeah. I think the short story is definitely a more interesting uh, genre than that. And I, I mean, I'm a devotee of the form. So for me, the whole pandemic has worked um, on two levels. So as a writer, I'm thoroughly fascinated with this whole dystopian thing. And this whole <laughs> idea that, you know, we have just, it's kind of made you so conscious of mortality and, you know, your fragility. Mm -hmm. So I'm totally fascinated by that. And as a responsible, I mean, Ali knows so I have my elderly mother with me and as a responsible son and you know I'm I'm worried right because things are not just hunky dory out here and you know things are yeah, imploding right. so you know so there's this whole dichotomy and because of this my work also it started expressing itself in two ways mm -hmm. so one is I started suddenly writing poetry which I hadn't done since ages so this very soulful mm -hmm. kind of deeply questioning kind of poetry came out mm -hmm. and where I'm making an inward journey and at the same time, to keep myself in this light, trippy state of mind, you know, which is a fascinatingly dystopian side of me, okay, uh, I'm writing these really funny, amusing shorts, you know, or working on short stories. And at the same time, working on this very trippy novel about Bombay in the 80s, where, you know, it was a very permissive mm -hmm. culture. We were enjoying the fallout of the whole flower park culture. So, you know, it's kind of been interesting because there are various sides of me coming out. And, you know, my poetry gave me realizations, like, for example, in one of the poems, uh, I had this thing that says, hey, the earth was never yours, nor has it ever been. It was only given to you for safekeeping, you know? So these kind of insights have been coming out, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, at the same time, there's a certain levity and there is a certain kind of uh, adventurousness in my prose. So 
So it's, it's been interesting. I think like any churning, you know, every application is of an act of destruction. So I think there is something going on there, which is definitely part of the creative process. Mm, that's great. You recall? I, love that. I feel like I'm living mirror lives with all of you in, in the UK and, and, and Mumbai <laughs> over here in San Francisco. I mean, it's, it's hard. It's, it's a long slog to work on a novel, which I'm doing. So I've just been giving myself permission to write short stories and saying it's okay if they're bad short stories, but feels more alive. And then what you're talking about, Mersban, I, I lost um, a family member and all I could do was write poetry, you know, and it was weird. I, you know, I'm not a poet, but that's what was coming out. And like, for me, it's been just giving myself permission to do that. So, you know, poetry I and- said, Be kind to yourself. Rico, your uh -huh. words, be kind to yourself. Yes, very yeah. important. Yeah. I mean, we yeah. live with novels for like, many years for me it's been many years so it's just it's never going to go away that novel is a part of me so you know i have this theory that a short story is like an affair you're on someone else's time so you better deliver and deliver quickly well, a, a novel is a marriage there are good parts and bad parts but you stay with it right yeah absolutely <laughs> more, more story yeah <laughs> Thank you so much, Reynolds and Okoje, Mersbin Shroff, and Rico Shisoko. It's been such an honor and pleasure to spend time with you and hear you read and engage us with your work. I cannot wait to see what else you have in store for us in the near future. As we like to say in Filipino, mabuhay, which is another way of saying more power to all of you. <laughs>